So we've taken a look at when cases of government getting involved, putting in price controls, right? we talked about price floors, price ceilings, quotas, taxes, tariffs. We took a look at all of these cases and we said, hey, look, they wrecked the efficiency of the markets. They made things worse off. Really, we made a big case against government intervention. What we're going to be taking a look at in this video, and in fact, in all the videos going forward, is we're really going to be changing our tone. We're going to be making cases now moving forward to say, hey, maybe maybe government intervention is favorable. Maybe we want government intervention. That is, maybe there's times where markets fail. That is, when markets cannot achieve allocative efficiency on their own, and thus we need government intervention. We need those price controls, taxes, tariffs, quotas in order to achieve at least a more efficient situation. So going forward, that's what we're going to be looking at. This video in particular, we'll be taking a look at the role of government. Why do we even have government? From then, we're going to be taking a look at what is a market failure, what causes market failures, and we'll be taking a look at how to correct market failures as we move on through this, through the rest of our course. Well, let's jump over then. Let's begin by talking about the role of government. Okay, so first off, going to be getting right a little first introduction, uh, introduction, introduction here is a little bit fluffy to start off. And what we're going to start off looking at is we're going to start off by taking a look at the role of government. That is, from an economic viewpoint, what is the role of government? Why should we or shouldn't we have governments? And what what really is their purpose? What do we expect them to do? Well, okay. What we say is that the role of government at minimum is to provide a monopoly of violence. So a monopoly of violence. And really what this means is that the government is really the only one who gets to enforce the rules, the laws, what there is. They are the only ones who have the legal right to use force. If somebody else comes along and says, hey, I want that thing of yours, I have a pretty big stick, I'm going to make that happen, well, government says, no, no, that's illegal, that's assault, that's intimidation, that's a threat, we're the only ones allowed to do that, so government has that monopoly of violence. Okay, minimum, this is what we want, right? Because by, by having only the government have this in place, not other people being able to intimidate, enforce, assault, etc., use force kind of idea, by only the government being allowed to is that, well, we don't just have people taking stuff from each other. Ideally, we want more than this though, right? Ideally, this is a pretty low bar to set for a, uh, for a, functioning, for a functioning market economy. So what we ideally would want is above a monopoly of violence is we would want to have rules and laws. Right. So and that is that we don't have a government that is bound by these rules and laws. Right. So we want the rule of law to prevail in the land. And that is so that, OK, sure, the government's the only one who gets to exercise force. And we know when and when not they're going to exercise that force. Right. We're we have an idea as to what we are and what we are not allowed to do. We're not always worried about, oh, if I go and open up this store, is the government going to crack down on me and take me and my family away? No, no, no. We know what the rules and the laws are, and we know that, okay, as long as we're following these, we're free to do as we please in the open economy. Big thing in that, right? The government must also be bound to these rules and laws. They can't just go and change their mind and be like, yeah, we're not going to follow that today. So this rule of law applies to both private and public spheres. What we would also want, right, is so we'd want, okay, government to be the only one who can exercise force. That that exercising exercising a force is bounded by rules and laws, and then attached to these rules and laws, we would want property rights, right? And property rights essentially tell us what we can and what we cannot own, what we are allowed to and what we are not allowed to buy and sell. So in this case here, there's certain things, right, that we have a society has deemed it is not okay to sell this right? Organs, right? You cannot go and sell your extra kidney and make a bunch of money. I say extra kidney, right? We have two of them. You need both, but you can function with just one. So, okay. Yes, technically there would be a market and there'd be a perfectly functioning market for kidneys in that kind of scenario. 
But we've deemed as a society that maybe that's not right. Maybe there's too much risk of problems arising in that market that we have deemed that, no, you cannot buy and sell human tissue, right? That's down to property rights, saying what you are and what you are not allowed to buy and sell. There's other things that we're allowed to buy and sell that, right, would be like, really, is that is that okay, right? Tobacco, we know straight all the problems, all the health implications, the third party, the societal implications, the health costs to do with uh, cigarettes. And yet we still allow this to be a functioning operating market despite that fact. So property rights ultimately determining as the government sees fit and society in a democratic state, society votes in and pushes that government to determine what is and what is not allowed to be sold, what is and what is not allowed to be owned, essentially. So in this case here, government gets to set the rules of the game. And if they're the only ones who get to use force, well, they're the only ones who get to enforce the rules of the game. So that's a minimum, right? At minimum, kind of our role of government. These three kind of things. And really, they, they, you see how they flow down. You see how they flow down. You cannot impose laws such as property rights if you do not have a monopoly of violence. If you have a strong militia within your country that is like challenging, like a rebel force, and they're challenging your monopoly of violence, well, it becomes really hard to put laws and enforce those laws when you have an armed rebel force within your country that's challenging it. So if you don't have a monopoly of violence, it becomes very difficult to enforce laws it becomes very difficult to enforce what can and cannot be bought and sold. Okay, let's carry on then. Let's take a look at what we will call our formal versus our informal defense, uh, defense of free markets. So a formal versus an informal defense of free markets. And really what it starts off with, we'll start off with this whole, I don't know, almost propaganda piece saying, hey, free markets are the best markets. They always work out, yada, yada, yada. And then, like I said, we'll spend the rest of our time going, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's not the case. So let's start off with our formal definition here. So our formal defense of free markets goes along these lines is that all markets if just left to be would eventually be efficient so if markets were left to be eventually they would be efficient that is, whatever problems might be there causing inefficiencies, if we just left it alone long enough, the market would sort it out, right? People would get smart. They'd figure out, hey, this isn't right. They would be able to sort it out in a market-based scenario eventually, right? How long is eventually? It, that, that could realistically be a long time, right? That might be realistically longer than society wants to wait. So, okay, what's our informal? defense. Our informal defense, this is a bit more realistic. Informal defense has three parts to it. First part is that free markets allow for the dissemination of power. Dissemination of power, right? It's one of those things where if we have a free market, it's just the market. It's just hundreds of thousands of producers, hundreds of thousands of consumers all coming together, organizing economic activity, determining market prices, determining how much wheat is being produced, how many computers are being produced, all of these goods and services we take for granted. Just hundreds of individuals all acting in their own best interests, determining optimal price, optimal commodity exchanged. There is no minister of the economy overseeing this and setting the price of wheat. There is no minister of agriculture determining, hey, this is how much wheat we're going to produce. Entirely just the invisible hand of market forces. So in this case here, because you don't need anybody in charge, it allows power to be disseminated. right? And it turns out that beyond this, anytime somebody has power, 
Well, power carries with it a sort of economic profit, and that economic profit that's associated with power puts a giant target on your back for others to get into that area, to challenge you in that area, to get that economic profit. And then just like in our perfect competition sense, positive profit will eventually be driven to zero. So it also creates this kind of dog-eat-dog -dog survival of the fittest situation that, hey, if anything pops up that is powerful, economic profit goes along with that, giving incentive to tear it down. So first kind of reason to have free markets, you don't need big, strong, powerful figures to rule the economy because the market can do most of it on its own. Next one, right, and kind of attached to this guy here with this idea that the, hey, the market through the invisible hand coordinates everything. Well, it's that we have this automatic, automatic coordination of resources. Right in this case here, we saw, hey, we have our production possibility frontier. From that production possibility frontier, we go down to the market. We get some amount of quantity produced. We get some equilibrium market price. And as a price changes, right, we have a shift in the demand curve. We have a shift in the supply curve. We get a new equilibrium price. That price is now a signal to create a new quantity. As we adjust, we say produce more wheat. Well, we change amongst our production mix, right? We shift our production, our substitutes. We move along that production possibility frontier and all of the markets just naturally realign themselves. This is automatic. Price of wheat goes up. We just automatically reshift all of our supply. We reshift all of our prices, our consumption preferences, hundreds of individuals all responding on their own to market forces to automatically re-coordinate to get an optimal utilization of our resources such that we can be allocatively efficient, right? We didn't need government to step in and say, oh, we just had a really bad growing season. Well, okay, bad growing season, wheat crops are down. We need to increase the price of wheat in order to compensate for this. No, 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 this is just market forces acting on their own automatically, right? And so again, because this is automatic, we don't need people in power to decide this, meaning we have this dissemination of power. So again, goes hand in hand. Finally, our final informal defense of free markets is to kind of, and this is where a lot of people cringe, is that the pursuit of profit, right? A lot of people really put a lot of the problems that we have in today's modern world to this pursuit of profit and being like, you know what? Because of this pursuit of profit, we have almost this dystopia or at least a view of a dystopian future pretty soon for us. And yeah, yeah, there are some problems with this for sure. At the same time, though, this pursuit of profit has been found to be the primary determinant of technological growth. So pursuit of profit has been found to be one of the primary determinants of technological growth, where technological growth, that there has been a huge aspect of increasing quality of life and standard of living. So... Technological growth, one of the biggest kind of benefits that we've reaped from a free market economy. And that really can go back to this pursuit of profit. So, yeah, you can make this case that, hey, pursuit of profit has led to a lot of kind of dystopianism. But at the same time, it's also led to a lot of great things that we take for granted. So our informal defense. Okay, so that's kind of our propaganda piece as to really why free markets are the best markets and truthfully most of this does hold true right we witness the comparison of free markets versus not free markets and typically we have better standard of living we have longer life expectancies we have healthier we have healthier lives better education better social results all of that goes hand in hand with free markets right and we've kind of seen all this in this informal response at the same time, sometimes we do have market failures. Sometimes we do have market failures, and market failures are one of the reasons why we might want to get involved to correct in order to get a more efficient outcome. And we'll get to that, but before we even get to market failures, let's take a look at some of our justification Let's take a look at some justifications 
for government involvement. So for government intervention. And really, there's going to be five reasons as to why the government may get involved, even if the market on its own was perfectly efficient, right? So kind of like in our previous chapters where we said, hey, market's at equilibrium, everybody's happy, surplus is maximized, we're allocatively efficient, and then the government puts in minimum wage, right, a price floor. Government puts in rent control, a price ceiling. Government puts in supply management, a quota or they put in taxes, or they put in tariffs, right? All of these kind of different things. They've intervened in a functioning market, and we'll give some reasons, some justifiable reasons as to why that might be the case. First, first reason is that we may simply just have a preference for some good or service to be publicly provided. So we might just have a preference for public provision. This is very much the case as to when we were talking about education, healthcare, heck, even policing services, right? We could outsource this. We could outsource policing to private contractors. We could outsource all education to private institutions. We could go private for healthcare, and we would have pretty close to allocatively efficient situations. That is, the market would be just fine doing it on its own. Instead, we have decided to get involved. We have decided to intervene in this free market to have a publicly provided healthcare service, to have public policing, to have public healthcare, public education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And this is just strictly, we've had a preference for this good, this service to be publicly provided within our society. And this really is a society to society basis. Here in Canada, we believe these things should be publicly provided, generally speaking. In other countries, well, that same view is not necessarily held. And maybe that's changing in some countries. Maybe it's changing more towards private provision in other countries. Society changes, society adapts, right? And politics is kind of that expression of social will. So in this case here, currently, well, sometimes society, even though it messes up with the free market, we just have a preference for it to be publicly provided. So we'll intervene, we'll implement price controls, quotas, taxes, some kind of scenario in order to make that so. Okay, second reason. Second reason is to protect, uh, I'm going to say to protect people from others. And this is the case where, hey, maybe individuals on their own, yeah, they'd be able to figure out it out if left long enough, but people could get hurt. So in order to make it so that people don't get hurt, we're going to protect people from other people, and we're going to put in certain interventions in order to protect you. And you're like, well, what kind of interventions are these? Well, simple things like requiring doctors to be licensed, Right, So, hey, in order to be a practicing medical doctor, right, I should be rather clear with that, in order to be a medical doctor, you need to be licensed. You need to have your medical degree, you need, you need to be licensed by the College of Physicians and being allowed to practice. Keep in mind that, hey, in a free market, you could practice, you could just do this on your own, and irrespective of your educational background, irrespective of your skills and the like, you could practice family medicine or surgery or what have you. In fact, this was done for a long time of history. And what would happen is, well, the free market, they would discern, are you a good practitioner? Are you a bad practitioner? The good practitioners would get more business. They'd see their business thrive. The bad practitioners, you would see them fall off right? Dog eat dog world of the free markets, the bad practitioners, the shady practitioners, the ones who are doing eh, maybe not so good things. Maybe they don't actually know how to do surgery. Well, people are going to eventually catch on. They're going to stop hiring them. Keep in mind, in that process, there were people who were getting surgery from people who weren't necessarily good to give surgery, to do surgery. People got hurt along the way. So in order to overcome that, we say, yeah, you know what, we're just going to put in rules and regulations. We're going to put in essentially a quota system by requiring these licenses in order to restrict the amount of doctors that there are in order to set this high bar that you must meet in order to become a surgeon, in order to become a family doctor, etc., etc. 
And all of this is just to protect people from other people. Same thing can be said for the financial industry. You need to be a licensed financial advisor to give financial advice, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be a professional engineer in order to stamp to say, yeah, I clear this building to be professionally to be well built. So all of that is just to protect people from other people. Our third case. Our third case is what we'd call paternalism. And paternalism, this is really just to protect people from themselves. This is the belief that people could not make proper decisions for themselves if left to be. They need a father. They need this paternal figure to guide them to say, yes, you can do this. No, you cannot do that. You are not capable of making the right decisions to protect you. Right. And this here is where we see laws like you have to wear a seatbelt. Right. In this kind of case, it's like, well, if you don't wear a seatbelt, you're really only harming yourself. But OK, no, that's going to be too much. So you can't figure that out. We're going to mandate that you must wear a seatbelt. This goes also into the case of criminalizing a lot of illicit substances. A lot of these illicit substances, all they would do is they would hurt the individual doing it. But we say, you know what, you're not necessarily able to make that decision for yourself. So we're going to make it for you. We're going to deem these substances illegal. These substances, oh, those ones are okay, right? Where do we draw that line in the sand? Well, that's just kind of a social decision that we make. This here, right, maybe a little bit more touching in our lives around us. This goes here in Canada. You cannot buy unpasteurized dairy. Right? Unpasteurized, I don't even know how to spell that. I will say it's something like that. Unpasteurized dairy. So unpasteurized milk, cheese, etc. All dairy in Canada is pasteurized. And if you've ever had it, there is a bit of a taste difference between pasteurized and unpasteurized dairy. Some people swear by unpasteurized cheese that it's so much better. But unpasteurized dairy carries with it a fairly small risk of infection that you can get sick. Right, Typically, amongst most, he most healthy adults, you're fine. You would never even run into that. But amongst those who are sick, infirm, old, young, well, the risk is there. Ideally, if just left to be, we'd have two markets. We'd have one market for unpasteurized dairy, and we'd have another market for pasteurized dairy. And individuals could make that decision, informed decision on their own to say, hey, I like the taste of unpasteurized dairy. I will take that additional risk. And I will pay the unpasteurized price versus, uh, I don't know if that risk is worthwhile. I'm going to go for the pasteurized dairy and I'll go through that. Ultimately, in a case of paternalism, where we have intervention along these paternalistic lines, it's just you cannot make those decisions on your own. You're not informed enough. You don't have enough information. You're not able to do so. So we will do it for you as a benevolent government is essentially the paternalistic argument. Our fourth case, our fourth reason to have government intervention, right? And in this case here, I just want to really go back. Let's get rid of this. We kind of were saying that we will talk about market failures, but that's not really the heading for this, sorry. The heading for this, right, this is justifications for government intervention, right? I would even add to this justifications for government intervention in a, uh, let's actually write properly. In a functioning market. So in a case where the market is functioning just fine on its own, what is a reason why we might intervene just the same? So our fourth reason, our fourth reason is social responsibility. And this here goes back to kind of the case where, hey, yes, you could have a functioning market for certain goods, for certain services if you were allowed to. But the government has said, no, you are not allowed to sell this or that. You have a social responsibility not to. And this could be situations just as simple as uh, your vote. Right? We know that, hey, in elections, we typically have voter turnout of about 50%, sometimes even less. In municipal elections, significantly less. There's a lot of people who would Technically, they're like, yeah, you know what? It's not worth the cost to me to go vote, so I'm just not going to. Yeah, there'd be a lot of people who would be happy to sell their vote and let somebody else vote for them. There could be a perfectly well-functioning market for this. 
you can see right already you're probably cringing of, oh, that's going to have a whole lot of social problems. Yeah, yeah, clearly it would have fly in the face of democracy. And as a result, what we say is, no, 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 you have a social responsibility to cast your own vote. You do not get to sell your vote. You are not allowed to do so. Same thing could be said for jury duty, right? Jury duty, hey, if you're called for jury duty, you have to give up so much of your time at your job in order to do jury duty. Often that's a foregone wage on your side. There are other individuals, though, who earn a lower wage who would be more than willing to do jury duty because it might even be more than what they currently get paid. Maybe they're unemployed. Maybe by doing jury duty, they're getting a wage. But again, if you are called for jury duty, you cannot sell your jury duty to somebody else. You cannot pass that off. That is your social responsibility in order to participate in the jury duty. So... Same kind of idea is that we have a social responsibility. Some of these we don't get to buy or sell or to pass these off. Fifth, uh, our fifth, and in this case here, it kind of just summarizes our previous four. I'll call this uh, fifth one here. No, not gem. Our general guiding principle. And our general guiding principle is that, hey, even if the free market could do it on its own, sometimes the outcomes of the market do not line up with the social outcomes that we want to witness. And so because of that, well, we want our social outcomes. We don't want the free market outcomes. So we will intervene in order to get the social outcomes. And that's, if you were to try to summarize those previous four, that's really it, is that market outcomes didn't align with our social views of right and wrong, our social views of what ought to be, these normative kind of statements. So because of this distinction, we have decided to go and intervene, to enter into the market and intervene and change things, put in some kind of price control in order to make, in order to make an outcome that we deem socially acceptable. So our five kind of reasons is to have government intervention in a functioning market. Let's now move on and let's take a look at what is, right, and we've alluded to this a few times now, let's actually get to it. What is a market failure? That is when a market fails to function when it is not working properly. And simply speaking, is that a market failure occurs when at some quantity exchanged, the marginal cost does not equal the marginal benefit, right? So we have some quantity exchanged in our market, and at that point there, the marginal cost, the extra cost of society is different than the extra benefit that society receives. So if ever we have this discrepancy at some quantity, we would say that the market has failed. Often, this can be simplified down, Typically speaking, our price comes off of our demand curve. Demand is also our marginal benefit curve. So often this is simplified to say we have a market failure whenever marginal cost does not equal price. So two kind of synonyms, two different ways that we can look at that. Let's take a look at then some of our cases which cause market failures. Cases where the market is unable to achieve this on its own. And let's just, let's just take a look at a market here for, for example, to start off. Price, quantity, we have downward sloping our demand curve. So let's keep in mind, this is demand or marginal benefit. And then upward sloping, upward sloping, we have our supply curve. That's our supply or our marginal cost. At equilibrium there. Well, at equilibrium, we've seen there's my price, there's my quantity exchanged. So I'll just call that Q prime for my quantity exchange. And we see, okay, at, at some quantity exchange, that's this guy here, we go up. And right there, we have our marginal benefit equal to our marginal cost. That is, at the same time, price equals marginal cost. So right at equilibrium, we're allocatively efficient. Our market is just fine. There are cases, however, 
where certain things happen and these certain things that happen make this not true. We are holding at times, at times Q gets held low, right? At Q low, we would get a marginal cost. We would get a marginal benefit, right? Let's add that in. Marginal benefit, marginal cost. Hey, these are not the same anymore. Oh, we have a market failure. We're not allocatively efficient any longer. So problem with that. We also have we also have the case where if we had Q high, if we overproduced, so at Q high, we would have a marginal benefit to society. We'd have a marginal cost. So right, I'll we'll call that QH for Q high. In this case here, the extra benefit is really low. The extra cost is way up there. Again, not efficient, not allocatively efficient. Again, we would have a market failure because, again, we have marginal benefit not equal to marginal cost. So that is any time that the market is unable to arrive at equilibrium on its own, that is problematic. That is a market failure. We would have reason to say, yes, we want government intervention in order to maybe correct this, or at least to help to assist to correct this. So let's take a look at some things that cause this to happen. And we will call these our causes of market failure. And right, truthfully, it's not limited to these, but these would be kind of our four overlapping large, sorry, not overlapping, our four kind of large categories that we could fit most of our causes of market failure into. And what are these? So at first, first, and this is what we'll be taking a look at first, is the presence of externalities. So externalities, we'll take a look into a lot more detail as to what exactly we mean by this. So don't worry too much. I'm just going to go through the list. We'll have pretty much a video on each of these going forward. But an externality is an external cost or benefit. So that is by engaging in an activity, while the cost of that activity is not incurred entirely by the person paying the price. Some of the cost is incurred by society on whole. Or similarly, some of that benefit is not entirely felt by the person consuming it. Some of the benefit is consumed by others as well. So anytime we have this external cost or benefit, that's an externality. That actually creates problems, a market failure. After that, well, what else do we have? We have the presence of market power. Market power, this is when that assumption of lots of small firms, lots of small demanders, right, uh, consumers is no longer met. You now have one large consumer or a few large consumers or one large producer, several large producers who now get to influence the market on whole. This creates problems. We'll take a look at this one on its own as well. We'll actually take a lot of time taking a look at that guy. Uh, if we take, if we recall, right, we had a bunch of other types of market structure that all falls into this market power scenario. We're then going to have the presence of non-rivalrous or non-excludable goods. So we'll take a look at this. We'll take a look at what we exactly we mean by rivalrous goods versus excludable goods, and we'll talk about that. Um, not going to get too much into it right now. That'll be in the future video. And then finally, again, we won't be getting too much into this one in 103 either. There are several courses that do go into a lot more detail with this, but the presence of asymmetric information. When, hey, you have information that the other party does not, and you're able to use that information for your advantage. That creates problems. So something else we have to consider. So rest of this semester, in a nutshell, will be us taking a look at each of these causes of market failure and what we can do if we even want to correct it. So 
that does us for this kind of introduction into government intervention, into this introduction as to what is market failure. In the next video, we'll be taking a look at externalities in specific. As we continue on through the semester, we'll be taking a look at each one of these in specific. So if you have any questions on this general kind of bit, really fluffy video, right? Just a whole bunch of information, ideas, theories, feel free to reach out to me either through the D2L Frequently Asked Questions or by email. Thanks.